Hi and welcome to Aside with Alan, Volume 5. Today we're going to look at the COVID-19 crisis, the Constitution and the Cabinet, in particular with focus on us having uh, essentially an acting Prime Minister uh, with, the, uh, with the news of Boris Johnson uh, being in intensive care. So we're going to look at the, the ramifications of this and try to apply it, as, as we have done in the other videos, to some of the stuff that, that we've been studying uh, in class. So Boris is, in, is uh, sadly in intensive care, um, and th there's been a huge rallying in support um, for him from the, the, the public, from the media, uh, and, and all areas and ac across the world uh, in that case. So we've got on one hand, a very personal kind of um, story of, of, of somebody with the virus, certainly again, which therefore has, has touched a lot of people. But on the other, other side of it, we've, we've got the kind of constitutional side of this. So, so what happens when our prime minister is incapacitated? Uh, how is our cabinet acting whilst all this is going on? Um, and, and there has been some talk in some areas of the media, though um, I'm not convinced by it, this idea that there could be some kind of coup um, and we could see um, members of the cabinet try and take advantage and seize, uh, seize power from Boris. But that seems a, an incredibly uh, unlikely scenario. So as we, we look at the, the constitutional ramifications, so um, we've got Dominic Raab, um, as is above me, uh, uh, leading uh, press conferences and things at the moment, uh, and, and he has taken charge. Um, now, there are no clear rules in the UK about what happens in this scenario. So in, in the US, there is a kind of clear line of command. Uh, if the president goes down, then they're replaced by the vice president, and then there's a whole line of succession um, below that. If any of you have watched um, uh, the series uh, Designated Survivor, then they, they actually build into planning when they have all the important people in one place they're kind of a designated person who's there ready to take over so in, in america with the codified constitution it is all really firmly set out on what the powers are and under what circumstances if somebody happens to that who's next and, what, and so on now in this country we don't have that unsurprisingly with our highly flexible and uncodified constitution um, Rob has been named as uh, the first secretary of state, um, and so he steps into Boris's shoes in effect. But it's unclear exactly what powers that gives him. So in theory, he could make appointments, he could carry out a reshuffle uh, if he uh, saw fit. He could authorise military action. There's a whole list of kind of the prerogative powers that a, a prime minister holds that theoretically now rest with Rob. Well, do they? I mean, we're not 100% sure. Um, I mean, could he, in, in a kind of slightly crazy scenario, could he write a letter of, of last resort? So could he he give the uh, the all clear for the use of nuclear weapons? I mean, again, we're talking kind of pie in the sky, highly unlikely things at that point. But it, it, it's one of those difficulties with our constitution as it stands. We get into these these incredibly unlikely scenarios like the one we have now, and it isn't 100% clear where we are. So it, it appears that we have Rob as acting PM, and so you would expect that he would have all um, the powers that an ordinary prime minister would have, yet he would be less likely to make significant changes or decisions. Because again, we don't know whether this is going to be a, a matter of hours, days, months, or, or how, how long it's going to be. Um, so there is no official position of acting prime minister. Uh, and then there's a couple of um, key things that, that, again, remain unanswered, other, other bits on top of this. So who decides when Rob's time in office stops? So some put, things were put in place that he was the kind of the designated stand in and, and it was all formally done with it becoming first secretary of state. But we will hopefully come to a scenario in the not too distant future where Boris returns and then we're, we're in this bit of, of who, who decides. Is it the doctors decide when Boris Johnson is fit enough to return to work? Does Boris himself decide? And is it going to be up to the cabinet? And the cabinet go, yeah, actually, we think you're uh, now in a uh, in state to come back. Um, what happens if Johnson says, right, I'm ready to, to take take the reins again and rub all the cabinet turn around and go, no, not yet. Um, so there are some interesting uh, ponderables in there. Uh, the chances are it will all work out as these things normally do in the UK. They, um, they work out fairly smoothly in the end.
but it, there are some important questions. And, and we are in a slightly awkward position in a time of crisis where the powers of the person at the top are unclear. Now, so how is the cabinet acting? Um, and this might be an accurate picture above me of the, the cabinet table at the moment, as all things are done remotely. And uh, uh, Larry the cat may, may have taken full charge. But really, all the stuff that we study about um, cabinet seems to be um, coming to the fore. So we do now really genuinely seem to have um, cabinet government and all those other theories about prime ministerial uh, domination and presidentialism to go out there, go out the bag. And it, it was like genuine old fashioned cabinet government. Uh, we're definitely seeing this idea of collective responsibility. There might well be divide splits uh, within cabinet, but in theory, and there's been mentions they're all going to present a united front, they're all going to sing from the same hymn sheet, which is going to make it more difficult to, for us to know who really is in charge and who's pulling all the strings, because everybody should theoretically all say the same thing. And we're definitely seeing um, individual ministerial responsibility. Um, so Hancock leading on health, um, Sunak uh, reading on the, leading on the economy, uh, Patel on, on law and order. So whenever there's a particular area that is being discussed, and often we'll see that minister turn up at, at the daily briefing or I'll speak to the media and, and say, like, this is what we're doing in this area. So we're seeing individual ministerial responsibility. Uh, we've definitely had reinforced this idea of collective responsibility and cabinet government. So that's really how we should we should see things and it should match with the theory that we we learn about um but how is the the cabinet actually acting well there does seem to be some gaps and some contradictions the timetable seems a bit odd in terms of exactly when this decision is going to be made um about uh, extending or, or reducing lockdown measures so um, that seems to have got a bit blurred in the last couple of days um who's actually in charge of that review uh, well there seems to be some indication that Rob is taking uh, taking the lead on that, but really, according to the legislation, the lead should really be with Hancock, and it, it's his responsibility as health minister. So again, we would expect, in normal circumstances, to see Boris and Hancock working together on it, and then the, probably the two of them at the conference making making the announcement. But there's maybe things getting a little less clear uh, with Rob in the picture and Boris out of it uh, uh, for the time being. So we, we've maybe got a bit of tension in there. We're not quite, again, how, how the personalities will work, what's going on behind closed doors. The one indication we have that maybe not always happy behind closed doors has uh, come from Gove. He's particularly making quite a big deal about stressing the idea of collective responsibility and cabinet government. Uh, and there has been um, some suggestions that maybe he's feeling that he's been passed over. Remember, it, when it came to the initial taking over doing the briefings, it was go. But when it came to uh, a kind of official replacement and somebody becoming uh, acting first secretary, then um, that went to Rob. So um, it would maybe not be completely unusual for Gove to maybe at the, the centre of maybe a bit of problems or difficulties as these things go forward. So that's kind of how we can see it in terms of how the cap is working. So I posed at the beginning, and I, I, I kind of dismiss it right from the off, this idea could there be a coup? So I have seen this um, coming across in some of, of the media. I do really think it's far-fetched. Um, in theory, having given up the power, it could be quite difficult uh, for Boris to reclaim it. However, there's a whole series of reasons why it, it won't be. Um, he, he's a very popular prime minister. He recently won a substantial majority, so it's, it's a majority of 80 seats. Um, and therefore, uh, the the Conservative Party feel a great debt and, and loyalty to him on that. Obviously, his illness um, has evoked enormous public sympathy. Uh, the cabinet, so the people with who've been the power's been handed to, were handpicked by him. Several, including Rob himself, have spoken uh, of being uh, friends with Boris as well as him being uh, him being their boss. So really, the idea that, that there won't be a pretty smooth passing back of power uh, to Johnson seems um, fairly, um, fa fairly unlikely, a bit pie in the sky, maybe. But again, we go back to the same issue that, uh, that we've spoken about in the past, which is the Constitution is not solid, it's not written down, it's not 100% clear. So exactly how this will work, we don't know, um, which is always one of those things that really makes politics interesting. So it's kind of really going to be a case uh, of watch this space. 
So again, thank you very much um, uh, for watching. Make sure you like, share and subscribe and I will speak to you all again soon. Bye.